Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, I'm just going to commence with uh, the, the acknowledgement from our, ourselves and Mental Health Professionals Network that we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and our participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. So I'm your facilitator this evening, Dr Conrad Cungru is my name, I'm a rural GP in Proserpine in North Queensland uh, where a, a mixed general practice like many others will identify from in an uh, area that doesn't have a terrible amount of, uh, of tertiary mental health support but nonetheless plenty of members of the community who struggle with their mental illness and mental health issues. Um, I'm going to introduce the rest of our panel also. We're going to, hopefully you've all had a chance to peruse the, uh, the, biograph the biographies of the panellists which were uh, disseminated with the registration. But I'm going to introduce you firstly to Sally Young. Uh, Sally Young is a social worker based up here in Queensland. Um, she's worked in child and youth mental health uh, at the Marta Hospital and also as a psychotherapist in, in private practice. Um, Sally, let's just open with what are some of the differences you experience when you're working between public and private systems in, in mental health? Um, well, I guess one of the, um, it, 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 I think there's big questions in our services about the sort of the um, continuity of care, which whether one's working from a public point of view or a private point of view, I think is a real challenge to um, to our overall mental health system. and. Uh, I think it's um, something we have to be mindful of, whichever side of the uh, the ledger we're working from. Great stuff. Thanks, Sally. We're now going to introduce uh, Dr Tim Fitzpatrick. He's a, a Victorian rural general practitioner like myself. In the case we're going to discuss tonight, is this sort of something that you see, tend to see a lot of in rural practice, Tim? Um, not in my clientele. I'm more uh, comfortable with the older ladies with high blood pressure or... Uh, middle-aged blokes with prostate problems or that sort of thing. So I must say I'd feel pretty uncomfortable with this uh, teenager and uh, I'd hope she wouldn't feel too uncomfortable with me, but um, she probably would initially, I reckon. Great. Thanks, Tim. We'll see how, how we go with it. Now going to introduce Associate Professor Rachel Rossiter, who's a New South Wales-based nurse practitioner with a very long history in uh, mental health nursing. Uh, Rachel, you've worked overseas in a number of countries as well. I'm just wondering if you've noticed any differences in, in self-harm patterns overseas compared to Australia. Oh, um, certainly when I worked many years ago in Madagascar and Solomon Islands, it wasn't something that um, was even on the radar. But more recently I worked in the Middle East and while I didn't have um, very much evidence of that there was that sense in my interactions with the young people that I worked with that it was something that was probably there and quite likely hidden and a great deal of shame associated with it for the few that I did talk to. Yeah absolutely and last but certainly not least I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Philip Hazel he's a New South Wales based psychiatrist. Philip you've uh, recently been involved in a very large community study on, on self-harm. Are you able to just quickly give us a Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure, Conrad. Uh, this was a, a survey that was led by Graham Martin, a colleague of mine who's recently retired, lives in Queensland. Um, we surveyed um, 12,000 people, um, ranging in age from 10 through to the late 60s, asking them about their recent self-harming behaviour, that is, uh, over the, the previous four weeks. And just in that previous four weeks, that 1% of the population that we surveyed had engaged in self-harm. There were differences depending on the age group that people belong to and gender, but I'll come to, back to that probably later in the webinar. Fantastic. Thanks, Philip. So, yeah, warm welcome to all of our, our panellists. Now we're just going to, uh, to go quickly through the through the ground rules for, for tonight. We just want to make sure that everybody gets a, an opportunity to get as much as they can out of the, the webinar tonight. So just a few simple ground rules we need to, to follow. Please be respectful of other participants and, and panelists. Um, you know, although it's, we're in a, in a virtual space, we're all sharing the, the same opportunity. So please, you know, behave as though you're actually in the room with each other in a face-to-face -face setting. 
Uh, you'll hopefully found the, the general chat box down the, the bottom of your screen there where we'd love you to post your comments and questions for us to consider. If you are, however, having technical problems, pop those in the, the technical help issue. And uh, just remember that, that's, that, that whatever goes into those boxes can be seen by everybody. So keep everything onto the topics of discussion. If the, uh, if the chat box is actually getting a little bit too distracting for you, you certainly can hide that. There's a small down arrow um, at the, the top of the chat box which you can use to minimise it. And then also we are very, very keen to uh, share your, your feedback uh, at the end of the, the webinar. So please, before you log out, you'll see a, a short exit survey pop up which we'd really appreciate if you'd all go ahead and, and complete. Why are we here tonight? Because we're all very keen to, uh, to learn about this as much as we, we can and, and that's what our, our set of learning objectives are, are here for. So we're going to use the case study to hopefully give the opportunity to describe the motivations and help-seeking behaviours of people who self-harm and associations between self-injury and psychiatric morbidity, suicide and substance use. We also want to be able to implement some key principles of providing an integrated approach in the early identification of help-seeking behaviours for people who self-harm. And we'd love to be able to identify the challenges, tips and strategies in providing a collaborative response to assist people who self-harm and increase their help-seeking behaviours. So we're going to, uh, to now move on to our, our case study for, for this evening, which uh, hopefully once again you've all had an opportunity to, uh, to, to peruse. But we're just going to basically uh, re revisit some of these, these, uh, these topics. So tonight we're going to be focusing our discussion on Stephanie, a 20-year-old girl who has been self-harming for six years. She's the eldest child in a family of three girls and was sexually abused by her father between the ages of seven until she left home at the age of 17. Stephanie began to self-harm at 14. Stephanie was completing year 12 when she left home at 17 and has struggled to finish school because she is sharing a flat with three friends and is working part-time in a supermarket whilst trying to complete a TAFE course. She does not want to socialise with her flatmates at times. She generally cuts her arms and sometimes writes words like hate, love, pain and general lines on herself. During the ages of 15 and 18, Stephanie is harmed every day. Stephanie has also indulged in heavy drinking and drugs and finds it difficult to form emotional relationships with people. She went to her GP to seek help. The GP put her on antidepressants and referred her to a psychologist. Some of the CPT therapy offered by the psychologist helped temporarily but Stephanie does not think the antidepressants are helping. So we're actually going to, uh, to call on uh, Sally Young first. Uh, Sally, we're, we're wondering, you know, as the, the therapist who might have been trying to help Stephanie uh, in the, the lead up to, to this scenario where we've got at the moment, if you might share some of your thoughts and, uh, and I insights in, into this presentation. Thanks, over to you. Hi. Oh, thanks, Conrad. Look, I should, I should just mention that I now work for Children's Health Queensland in Kim's, and so I'm speaking from that point of view, from a Kim's point of view, although I think it's called CAMS in the rest of Australia, outside Queensland. Look, firstly, I, I want to say that uh, Stephanie's a young woman who lives with significant risk in her external relationship world, her abusive father, her apparent lack of close relationships and supports, the burdens of her anxieties about her, her younger siblings, and the lack of a protective mother, that there's a mystery in the narrative as to where her mother is. Uh, Stephanie also lives at risk of her internal state, which is so painful at times that self-harm is an attempt to feel better <coughs> for it. So I, I guess that sort of last part is, is how I try to sort of think about self-harm. It's, it's an attempt to, to, to feel better or feel something often. Um, in, in the assessment, I, I like to have in mind that uh, Stephanie is a significantly traumatised young woman and it's Im very important that the assessment in itself doesn't re-traumatise her th through our style of questioning. Um, and the, the, In this, I always think of the risk of the overuse of risk checklists or assessments can 
uh, 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 although they certainly have their place, but it's uh, it's important it's not primary in the connection and, and at the price of connecting with Stephanie. Although equally important, it's uh, that it's it's important that Stephanie gains a sense that the clinician is not frightened to talk about her self harm or, or potential suicidal thoughts if they're there. Of course, as part of an assessment, if it's possible to get something of a developmental history um, and an assessment of current functioning, it, it, it's important to get a sense of what, what belongs to over a long time and what belongs to the current situation to think what, what would be useful. And of course, we'd be assessing for trauma, anxiety, depression, developmental issues, and it may be all of these um, factors, but what, what is the mixture of this, um, these factors in thinking about Stephanie? It's important that risk and safety be key themes in the dialogue with Stephanie as, as th these relate to the area of her trauma. For instance, one might ask a question of Stephanie of how does she manage the part of herself that wants to hurt herself? So how can she be safe with her, herself, as it were? Well, also important in assessment, it's, in, it's particularly um, you know, a young woman to identify are there any secure adults or friends in Stephanie's life who may support her and may also be allies to the, to the treatment. Steph Stephanie may need help working out who, uh, who she can trust and how she can trust others, as that may not be part of her life experience of knowing how you can work that out. It, it might also be important to introduce uh, um, the idea to Stephanie that she has a right to feel connected to others and to act actively support the development of connections. And perhaps this might be her mother or other key people in, in, in her life. As, as there's a bit of a pattern in her, her history of withdrawal and isolation. So uh, th this is a, an area of vulnerability. She may need a clinician who has the capacity to reach out to her, particularly in the early stages of connecting. She'd be the sort of girl who, if she didn't turn up for an appointment, it might feel much more important to ring her than to send a letter or, 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 um, or just wait for her to contact, given her level of vulnerability. A, a, sort of, a, a level of active reaching out might be very important. In the work, it will be important to acknowledge her strengths, her amazing survival capacity, given, <coughs> uh, given her history. That she, and for instance, she's left an abusive home. She works and she attends TAFE, and that she's help-seeking, that all these things in themselves are strengths that need to be, be recognised alongside her vulnerabilities. It's very important that Stephanie is given an opportunity to feel listened to and, and to tell her story. Some of the challenges in the work would be at determining the question of whether to notify Department of Child Safety and or the police regarding the potential abuse of the siblings and of Stephanie's past abuse. So working this out um, will, will be a difficult area. Um, I notice that Stephanie tends to isolate herself and may avoid or fear the consequences of attempts at justice for herself and her siblings. So that will, may take some work as well. Perhaps in the end of this dilemma, the therapist may feel obliged to take responsibility for a notification, so if the siblings are, uh, it, you know, it does sound terribly risky. Um, and that Stephanie may experience this as a betrayal of her privacy. So important to keep these issues in the relationship, to continue to talk about them as, as openly as possible. Given Stephanie's history, trust may well be difficult for her. It's important that, that the therapist stays sensitive to ruptures in the therapeutic alliance that one might sort of injure her emotionally without quite realising it, so staying perhaps extra sensitive with a, a girl with this history. 
she may well be ambivalent about seeking help and this needs to be understood and borne in mind. Given Stephanie's painful situation, she may have a tendency to symptom substitution. For example, in the history, the, the, the movement from self-harm to drug use. So it's important that the intervention is focused on Stephanie and the whole of her functioning and experience, not just one behaviour. Um, so we're, 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 we really are trying to help her. In the challenges of collaborative work, given Stephanie's level of risk and her suffering, the more opportunity she has for a stable relation, therapeutic relationship, the better. However, also given her history, she may be the style of uh, patient or client who, oh, I've just lost my screens, uh, who, who may present from time to time and um, at emergency departments or may sort of be a bit haphazard about her appointments. And, and so the, it may need a whole of system aware, awareness of her. The therapist may need the support of the multidisciplinary team to help and contain, uh, um, contain and manage the anxieties regarding working with, with Stephanie. Um, I mean, it would be surprising if she was an easy patient to work with. Uh, yeah. Important that the team and the professional network does not mirror Stephanie's trauma for example, fragmentation, lack of connection, lack of appropriate information sharing. That uh, it's important that, uh, a bit like the idea it takes a village to raise a child, it may take a, a network to, to be containing for, uh, for Stephanie. It may be important she has support in the transfer to either her GP or an adult service once she is over 18 and that termination of the work may be difficult and may need planning over time, if, if possible. And I appreciate this, that that's the ideal and it doesn't always work as ideally as that, but, but that, that's what Stephanie needs. Thanks, thanks, Sally. No, right. that's a, so that's a back, back to you, Conrad. Thank you, thank you so much for, for that, Sally. That, 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 that's marvellous. So we've we've brought up to to what some of our our concerns are and and what you know we can we can certainly see you know the, the the damage that can can be there, but of course now Stephanie's turned up with with her GP. Um, Tim, what what are your thoughts about this? Where, where, where are you uh, where are you seeing the the position for Stephanie at the moment? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So Plan A hasn't worked. You've sent her off to the psychologist or the um, social worker and you've tried some medication uh, and you've got this young girl who I would um, uh, feel a lot of trouble getting a rapport and a trust with I would think and uh, from what Sally said is, is a hell of a lot of time required isn't it and you may not be very time rich you know you might have a waiting room full um, but I would like to try and get some um, trust and rapport with Stephanie and I'd like to try and make her think that she uh, has someone who she can come back to, you know, if the initial referral hasn't worked and she might, you know, develop some sort of relationship, therapeutic relationship with you over time. Um, all right, so my initial um, referral to a social worker and uh, antidepressants hasn't worked too well and um, I'm thinking she's probably beyond my skill set and I, I'm uh, wanting to get some extra expert help with her but I'm mindful she's going to have to retell her story to a fresh person every time. And I'm wanting to try and get some trust and some ongoing um, a relationship that she sees me as a safe uh, person to come back to and confide in. Um, and I might, you know, end up having her longitudinally for a long time and be there after hours for her and um, manage crises and stuff like that. So um, I'm interested in trying to build rapport and trust and a therapeutic relationship. Um, and, but I, I am wanting to refer on for more expert opinion on um, how, how to handle her. I really uh, found Sally's presentation valuable and I'm mindful that um, a lot of the stuff she said is going to take a heck of a lot of time and I'm probably not very time rich to do a lot of that stuff. Um, so uh, oh, I'm looking for strategies to... Um, yeah, improve trust and so on, but um, within the 15-minute consult or, you know, 
I suppose you could get her back for longer consults too. So anyway, I, I'm looking to refer her off, uh, but get her to come and see me within the month and see how things are going, make sure she feels contained and looked after. And possibly I would give her a uh, after hours contact, or I would give her an after hours contact number to phone me if there's a real crisis and she needs someone to talk to. Um, I, I'm uh, taking that the uh, safety check has been done to some degree, suicidal ideation and so on, but um, it would be worth revisiting that too. Um, right. Fantastic, Tim. Thank, thanks for for that. So we, we recognise that, look, you know, sometimes these, uh, the, these presentations really do test our own skills and, and boundaries and we, we certainly recognise when we do need the care or the, the assistance of others around us. Um, and it, it might be at this time that we're needing to, to call through to the hospital or to one of our local services to be able to assist us with, uh, with the care of a, of a patient like Stephanie at this, at this time. We're now going to, uh, to ask for the perspective of, uh, of, of Rachel uh, if if Tim's called you at the uh, at the the mental health team and uh, is needing to pass on, Rachel, I'm wondering if you might be able to happy to to share your thoughts uh, on this presentation and and some of your experiences. Thank you, Conrad. I'm uh, delighted to hear that um, Tim that you have the willingness and desire to to make sure that. Um, Stephanie can come back to you that she knows that you're there as a, cons a consistent per person because so I, I think it's really important to recognise that an acute care mental health services are just that. Their focus is triage, specialised mental health assessment, crisis stabilisation, a focus on short-term options tailored to individual needs. And anyone who's assessed does not require an admission and are then referred often to appropriate services in the community. Now this will vary a little bit but from area to area, but it will certainly, especially in rural areas, be very much the case if you do have access to acute care mental health services. As a clinician on um, triage or seeing Stephanie, my first focus is, of course, is she at immediate risk to herself or others. And bear in mind all that Sally's already said is and our capacity to, do, to actually re-traumatise Stephanie. So I'm going to be very gentle and yet hopefully thorough in engaging with her and seeking to understand what's happening for her. I would hope to do a comprehensive assessment where I'm trying to understand much more clearly the function of self-harm for Stephanie. And I'm keeping in mind that she's got a 10-year history of sexual abuse and she's been self-harming for, for more than six years now and she's 20. So this is not something that's just been around for a couple of years. This has been something that's been part of her life now for a significant period. I will have some degree of concern about an increasing use of alcohol and drugs to manage her emotional distress and look at the challenges that she has with emotional isolation and her interpersonal skills. And it seems that she's got very little in the way of family support and perhaps struggling to achieve some of her developmental tasks. At 20, she's still attempting to complete secondary school while she's working part-time. And I also see that she's already had first-line treatment, CBT, and a trial of antidepressants. Also, as I think about Stephanie from the story that we've got, I can see that she's also vulnerable to further abuse. On the other hand, I see that she has some readiness to engage with services. She's turned up first to her GP and now she's come for a further assessment. And I'll be looking to very carefully identify her strengths and look at the examples of resilience. And Sally's already reviewed some of those for us and suggesting that this is a young woman that, despite all the difficulties, has been um, able to, to keep going. She's moved out of home. She's living independently, living with some peers and working and studying. So, Stephanie, I think it would be important that, if at all possible, I organise a, a psychiatrist review as an outpatient. 
what I want to do is make sure that we're not missing anything else that um, may be part and parcel of what's driving the self-harm. We know that she's got a significant trauma history, but we haven't got enough there to tell us more. I'd be wanting to exclude things like an anxiety disorder, depression, attachment disorders, complex trauma disorder, or emergent access to personality disorder. And I'd be asking for formulation and, and treatment recommendations. But at the same time, I would also look to see if it was possible to connect Stephanie with some additional community support services to reduce her social isolation. She's at TAFE and she's trying to study if there's the possibility that there's TAFE support services that may be helpful. And for, for those of us who are in rural areas, using some of the online resources that are available can be very helpful. And I've listed a couple there that I've found to be useful for young people. Now I'd just like to, I guess, draw our attention to areas that I think sometimes become um, an easy option. I, someone's referred to me in the acute team and no, they don't meet the criteria for crisis intervention, but I need to refer them somewhere. This young woman's got a history of sexual abuse. Let me refer her to sexual assault services or let me refer her to drug and alcohol services, and then I've actually done something. And I'd just like you to consider that when you consider a referral to sexual assault services, be thoughtful about this. Stephanie currently manages her emotional pain with self-harm, drug and alcohol misuse and withdrawal. And if we think about what she's going to need in the way of internal resources to go to sexual assault and start to address the um, trauma that's, that she's experienced. Some recent um, research suggested that one of the things that was most predictive of whether young people complete treatment for, if they've been sexually abused is if they are using avoidance symptoms. So perhaps now may not be the most useful time to refer um, Stephanie to sexual assault services. If I then think about drug and alcohol services, I would be asking myself, is substance misuse the primary concern here or is it an indicator of underlying issues that need to be addressed? If substance use is having a marked negative effect on Stephanie's capacity to study and work, then it may be appropriate. And I'm raising those points for us to think carefully about. And then I'm going to look at what, as well at the risks here, not just the risks for Stephanie um, from herself. And I, with the little information that we have, I would think of her as having a possible chronic risk at the time of referral rather than acute risk. We've got no history given of suicidal ideation or, or past suicide attempts. But there is a significant risk of iatrogenic harm. And we run the risk of exposing Stephanie to stigmatising attitudes in some um, mental health settings. We run the risk, perhaps, of her being labelled as borderline or attention-seeking. And we also run a risk, if we're not careful, of focusing on a pathology rather than on her resilience and strengths. And there's a risk associated with unhelpful referrals. At all times, although I may be working in an acute setting, I'm going to keep in mind and keep forefront that my focus needs to be on establishing a safe therapeutic space and also making sure that I'm staying connected with Stephanie's GP so that there is that continuity of care. And I'd like to draw your attention to the increasing resources that are available for us when we think about trauma-informed care. And Cossellini said that it stands to reason that the most devastating types of trauma are those that occur at the hands of caretakers. And Stephanie's experienced that. We need to make sure that as 
other caretakers, we're not also um, in, imposing more trauma. So effective trauma-informed services not only address the impact of past trauma they seek to be aware of and sensitive to doing no further harm. And I like to remind myself at all times that symptoms such as self-harm are, are adaptive. Stephanie's used this because it works for her and it has worked for her. And she's hopefully at a space where she's now ready to start looking at some other things that may be more helpful. But if we are able to work from a strengths-based approach, we can be empowering of Stephanie's existing resources and make sure that we connect her with people that are going to take that strengths-based approach. Over to you, Conrad. Wonderful. Thank you very much for, for those those insights, Rachel. That's a, a fantastic uh, picture of, of, of the, the thinking that we were at with uh, with this type of presentation, and uh, really has built on built on a lot. And you, you've certainly acknowledged there that sometimes, look, you know, we, we need to make sure that she's safe, get that that safe therapeutic space going on, and then see what sort of expert care we can access to to really make sure we put evidence-based strategies in place and help her out with it. So you'd already highlighted the need for us to, uh, to perhaps uh, involve uh, an outpatient psychiatry review. And I'm going to wonder now, Professor Felpazel, if uh, if you might share your thoughts on on Stephanie's presentation for us. Sure, thanks, Conrad. Um, I should probably let people know that um, I'm a clinician researcher, so I tend to research the things that I see the most of, and self-harm is, is one of the problems that I guess we see a fair amount of, if not a lot of, in clinical services for uh, young people, and it's, uh, it's one of the clinical problems that I'm most likely to be called about after hours when I'm, when I'm on call, on uh, nights and on weekends. I'm going to be talking about uh, some more general issues and then attempting to, I guess, bring it back to um, Stephanie's particular circumstances. So the first slide we've got up here is some data from a predominantly European study, uh, but you'll notice if you look across the bottom there, Australia got honorary European status for this uh, study. It was included in a European cohort. And there was a huge survey of 15 and 16 year olds that was undertaken in schools. Um, and uh, the key questions were around uh, the prevalence and motivation for, for self-harm. To make sense of what's uh, there in the figure, um, you're probably best paying attention to the um, the medium dark bars because that reports on the rate of self-harm in the previous year, which for most of us is the easiest thing to make sense of. And um, you'll see that uh, for uh, females aged 15 to 16, um, the rate of self-harm in the last year was sort of up there around the 10% overall. There was a fair bit of variability was um, noticeably low in the Netherlands and uh, somewhat higher in, uh, in Australia, but around about uh, one in 10 girls, and it turns out to be about one in four, one in five uh, uh, boys in this age range. Um, the, uh, the same rate's been found in uh, many other studies, but this one just is so robust because uh, uh, there were so many young people involved. Um, for this study, um, Self-harm included people who were suicidal, but uh, it, people also, it, it also included people who were self-harming and didn't have uh, suicidal ideation. When you look at people who self-harm where there's clearly no suicidal intent, actually, the, for the most part, the gender differences almost completely wash out. The rates are pretty much the same for, for males and females. Now, that's a lot of young people self-harming. Um, uh, when you think about it in total numbers. Of course, very few of them are getting to clinical services. We estimate that it's only about one in 10, one in eight um, people in the community who self-harm who come to clinical attention. And they may not come to clinical attention because of the self-harm. They may come seeking help for other problems. Um, and there are likely to be some differences between those who get to clinical care and those who don't. Um, but one of the main reasons that people get to hospital for self-harm is pretty obvious. It's that their self-harm 
requires of itself medical attention. So cuts that are too deep or an overdose that's made them sick, uh, these are the common reasons that people actually get to hospital. So still paying attention to the same study, um, the young people who participated in it were asked about their motives for self-harming and they, in, they were able to choose from the menu and they were able to choose more than one, uh, 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 one motive. Um, but you can see the standout one in terms of the most common was I wanted to get relief from a terrible state of mind. Um, that seems to be probably the, the most common uh, motive uh, across the age span really. It's, uh, the, the first motive for self-harming is really about dealing with internal um, and unpleasant emotions. And for some people, um, self-harming actually provides temporary relief. In fact, I suspect it's the people who get noticeable relief from self-harming who continue to engage in the behavior. People who do it and it doesn't do much for them um, tend to do it once or twice and then, and then stop. Um, wanting to die is uh, um, up there, is, is still a pretty common motive, and then wanting to punish oneself. Uh, and only then do we start getting into motives that are about communication with other people. So um, uh, just in case there was a myth out there that um, self-harm is largely uh, you know, manipulative behaviour or a cry for help, no it's not. Um, it's predominantly about uh, managing one's own feelings and often very unpleasant feelings. What we know about the natural history of self-harm, um, I guess maps on to uh, Stephanie quite well. So the typical age of onset is somewhere between uh, 12 and 14 years. I think from memory, Stephanie was around 14 when she started uh, self-harming. Uh, the course is variable. Uh, most people have ceased uh, within five years of starting. So Stephanie's an outlier. She's already continued um, uh, self-harming for over six years and it doesn't look as if the behaviour is moderating. So she's a little unusual. Um, the typical reason people give for cessation of self-harm is that the behaviour is no longer serving a useful purpose. Um, and when I've talked to people uh, who were previously self-harmers and no longer engage in the behaviour, uh, they rarely attribute treatment as being the main cause for stopping. Um, they, they usually um, describe it in terms of, well, I found other ways to cope, or uh, I no longer have problems, um, or uh, that the, the self-harm was just no longer, no longer useful. I'm sure people are pretty interested in the association between self-harm and psychiatric disorder. Um, and uh, the source I chose to present this evening to answer that question um, comes from a systematic review. So again, we're talking about big numbers. Uh, it comes from a colleague of mine, Keith Horton, who's based in Oxford in, um, in England. Um, so he did a systematic review of 50 different studies from 24 different countries. Um, bottom line, uh, more than four out of five people who present to hospital with self-harm meet criteria for at least one um, psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, it's quite common for people to meet uh, criteria for more than one diagnosis. Um, the most frequent disorders were depression, anxiety and alcohol misuse. Um, and then additionally for people uh, aged 18 years and younger, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and conduct disorder. That's not to say that those conditions were necessarily the reason the person was self-harming. We need to remember these are very common disorders. So anxiety affects about one in 10 people, um, depression about uh, uh, one in five, one, uh, one in six. ADHD is pretty common, maybe about uh, one in 20. Conduct disorder, maybe a little less so. so um, anybody who's in strife and presenting to hospital is, is likely to meet criteria for one of the more common um, mental health problems. That's not to say that self-harm doesn't occur in association with more rare conditions such as schizophrenia or bipolar, uh, but just because they're less common conditions, we are less likely to diagnose it when we see people in hospital. Now, the other issue was personality disorder, and this study was done back in the days when personality was diagnosed separately from the other conditions. 
And uh, Keith Horton and his colleagues found that about um, a quarter of people, uh, a quarter of adult patients met criteria for personality disorder. Um, before I leave the slide though, just a word of caution. Um, uh, these studies would have been derived from um, hospital uh, record data um, and the diagnoses would have been made on the run and they may not be that reliable. Um, so diagnoses often change once a crisis situation is over, both the patient and the doctor see the situation a bit differently. So just take the data with a, a little grain of salt. What's the association between self-harm and uh, death by suicide? Well, um, again, I'm going to uh, reference Keith Horton. Um, this is a study he did himself uh, um, from presentations to hospital in the Oxford area in the UK. Um, it only, was only concerned with patients aged 18 or less, so a little younger than uh, Stephanie. About three quarters of these people were female and they were followed up for at least three years following their self-harm presentation to hospital. So 1% of these people at three years uh, were deceased. Um, and of those who were deceased, half the deaths, um, or 0.5%, were either suicide or an undetermined death. Um, the factors associated with suicide um, or an undetermined death were being male. Um, intriguingly, cutting at first episode, because we often think of cutting as being a less, perhaps malignant form of self-harm and uh, whether the person has undergone psychiatric treatment. Now, that's not because psychiatric treatment causes suicide, it's because psychiatric treatment is a marker of more severe um, mental illness. Um, but from these data, remembering that maybe only one in 10 or one in eight people who self-harm ever get to hospital or ever get to clinical care, suggests to us that for the most part, the outcome for people who self-harm is not fatal. Um, in fact, in most situations, Self-harm is a reasonably benign um, condition, but at times it becomes malignant. And really that's where our clinical skills need to come into play to identify the problems or the patients where the problem is turning malignant. What are the characteristics that indicate that things are, things are turning bad? Thanks, Conrad. Fantastic, Philip. Thank, thanks so much for, for uh, that, sharing that information and that evidence base there for us. So we, we move on now a little bit to our uh, session. We're just going to try to cover some of the, the broader concepts that we've, we've covered here, and then we're also going to try to address some of the questions which have been coming up through the audience, both tonight and also in your, your pre-registration opportunities for, for questions. So we might just uh, start off. We've already heard that Stephanie's uh, engaged a little bit from what's happening with her flatmates at, at home. And she's also indicated to us that she's uh, she's very worried about her privacy privacy and, and confidentiality. Um, a setting for some of us might be that one day we uh, we get a visit or we receive a message from her from her flatmate saying that they're concerned about Stephanie and would like to come in and speak to you about uh, about their, their, their concerns. How would members of the panel uh, manage this type of issue? Sally, I wonder what you might think on that. Oh, well, uh, I guess it's a sort of common dilemma for us all. I, I mean, I guess the sort of first level of boundary would be um, one, uh, I'd take a position of, um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear their point of view, the, per, the flatmate's point of view, but I'd need to um, pr protect um, Stephanie's privacy. I, I guess there's even a step before that, which is, um, how does how do they know that Stephanie attends the clinic? So somewhere in, in the conversation, one would be trying to, if it was a, if they rang or something like that, trying to sort of listen for um, how they know that whether this is something um, yeah, that they've known through Stephanie or some other source. I, I guess I would be encouraging them to uh, uh, do they have Stephanie's permission to uh, um, to, to speak to someone. Um, this may or may not be the case, but that would be the ideal that there is some discussion with Stephanie. If if not, I guess it, one would just be taking that position of of listening without um, revealing a, a, anything. Um, um, of, of Stephanie's situation, um, I, I guess depending what what 
what they say, I'd also, um, I, I may be encouraging them to let Stephanie know they've been in contact with me, or I may ask them for permission to let Stephanie know that that um, that they've been in contact with me. Um, it, it's, it, it, but it continues to be an area of delicate negotiation to you know, protect Stephanie's privacy. But with such an at-risk at girl, one doesn't want to have too many high boundaries where, where you know, a flatmate who's very worried about her can't communicate with, um, with a professional who's helping her. Uh, they're my first thoughts, anyway. Yeah, does any, anybody else on the, the panel have any, any thoughts about how we, we help with, um, with other, other flatmates or friends, particularly in the area of, uh, of social media where the, uh, our patients are less concerned about their confidentiality on digital space than they are in the, in the real world, how we might uh, address this, this issue? Um, as a GP, I get uh, phoned a lot from concerned relatives and various people, you know, oh, I'm worried about mum, I'm worried about my sister. And then I usually say, oh, look, uh, you, thanks for taking the trouble to phone in. Um, you're obviously concerned. Um, is it all right if I let them know that you've phoned in? And, um, you know, it, it could be a very powerful thing coming from someone who's close and caring about them to, to hear that someone else is worried. And uh, if they're acting in best interest and they're uh, sharing information, um, uh, sometimes it can be a really useful thing, I reckon, if you can use it like that. Mm. Great. Some of the, one yeah, of the, um... the, sorry, Conrad, um, I guess the ideal would be if um, the flatmate would agree to come with Stephanie um, to an appointment and um, talk about her concerns with Stephanie there. That would be, that would be fantastic. Yeah, one of the uh, the features a lot of people are are asking about on online is the uh, the, the appropriateness of DBT uh, dialectical behaviour therapy uh, in, uh, in consideration like this. Just wondering what might be the clinical features in Stephanie that might lead us to suggest that this would be an appropriate part of the treatment plan. Well, are you happy to expand on that a little bit? Um, so uh, the I guess the signals with Stephanie that indicate she might do better with DBT are um, uh, some of the conflictual relationships she's had or the isolation she's had um, uh, from her peers and if it's their um, uh, chronic emptiness. Um, another feature that triggers the need for, uh, well I think triggers the need for DBT is if the person has you know, problematic interactions uh, with, um, with helping resources. That's doesn't seem to be a feature of Stephanie at this point. Any other panellists have any experience with DBT that they think uh, would be particularly useful or uh, warrant in this position? Hi, um, it's Rachel. I have um, worked in a, a couple of rural areas where the team have not been able to deliver a full DBT um, program because it's very resource intensive, but where a number of um, community team members have developed some skills in leading um, school groups and they've run um, short programs with young people like um, Stephanie, who, especially if Stephanie started um, presenting on a very regular basis, very distressed or having cut more deeply and requiring medical intervention um, and using that connection to help her get some skills on board to look at ways that she may be able to develop some distress tolerance skills and a broader range of effective um, emotion regulation skills and sometimes that can be helpful. Mm, marvellous. So it, it, absolutely, that it's, it's one of our more resource-intensive sessions that needs to be delivered by somebody who understands and, and knows how, how to, to use that. And sometimes that's not easy to, to obtain in a face-to-face in -face setting. I just wonder if, if the panel would consider the use of e-therapy or, or Skype or other online technologies uh, for Stephanie to, to help with delivery of services. Uh, Rachel, is that something you've used much at all? 
I think this is a, a really interesting area and had an experience, a number of experiences working in a rural area where, um, aside from my own therapeutic skills there, when there was no um, private psychiatrist in town and there was very little in the way of, of resources. And I started using um, Mood Gym and eCouch as an adjunct to my regular sessions with seeing people and found that sometimes they were really useful where I had a, a young person who had limited emotional literacy, so their capacity to um, describe their internal world or to talk about it was very limited. And for some reason when they would do a module of mood gym and then come back and talk to me about it, they had the experience of, I guess, finding that in that rather innocuous um, online world, there was someone, there were other people who were describing the sorts of things that they experienced. And it seemed to be a, a useful adjunct and something that sometimes people <coughs> found um, easier to negotiate rather than talking to someone. Mm. So it's certainly something that, that's handy to have as, as one yeah. of the adjuncts for, for us. Um, we've already mentioned how important it's going to be for us to be able to establish and, and maintain a, a therapeutic relationship with, uh, with Stephanie or with, with adolescents in general and being able to establish rapport and, and maintain their trust and to, to have that relationship going on longer term. Tim, I'm just wondering if, uh, if when Stephanie was, uh, was sent around to see us in that, that first instance, uh, and we'd suggested that she needed to be referred on to, to the hospital. If, uh, if, if she'd actually been reluctant to, to follow our advice, would we be in a situation where we need to perhaps schedule her under the Mental Health Act? I don't think so. Um, if she, you didn't think there was any immediate risk of um, you know, serious self-harm, um, I mean, I suppose it, you know, it really is hard for her to get somewhere. She, maybe she's a teenager with no car, and the you know nearest place is an hour and a half away and not very accessible for her. Um, it might be one, maybe you would, you know, you or someone could, you know, in theory, phone her every day with her permission and you know see her very intensively for a short period of time just to see if you could get some sort of connection and trust, and you felt comfortable enough to persevere on your own, perhaps with. Um, phone consulting, a, a nice consultant if you have one who you can talk to just to get a bit of um, sort of support for yourself and backup. Um, uh, it, it'd depend on your time and resources and all that sort of stuff and how you were going yourself otherwise probably, um, how snowed under you were. Um, it, it wouldn't be out of the question though. I think it'd be a reasonable thing to do. Maybe I'd be talking to Sally who saw her initially and you know sharing my thoughts with her. Um, and um, uh, using a bit of uh, your network and expertise and um, yeah, maybe it would be one you, you gust out for a while without sending her off somewhere but yeah, probably getting a bit of backup somehow. Um, thanks, thanks, Tim. A lot of the, the participants have been asking about how we might best uh, build a relationship and uh, and ask be able to get Stephanie to open up about about things. Sally, I'm wondering, you know, if you were noticing that this uh, that this young patient presenting to to you did have a series of scars, but wasn't actually going to be saying anything about it, how would you approach uh, a, a patient to to get them to open up about the the damage that might be there? Oh, thanks, Conrad. I think this is a sort of really common dilemma for uh, those of us working with young people with these difficulties. Um, I mean, I think there's probably in any session there's a sort of timing question as to when one speaks to something that's unspeakable for for the young person. Um, if if they are um, if there are cuts that I can clearly see, I might when the time feels right in the session say something like I wonder what those cuts are saying uh, saying at the moment what, what those cuts are saying to me or uh, you know, to try and sort of help the person sort of speak through the through the wound as it were as to what the what what, what might they might be communicating to themselves or, 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 or to um, to other people 
Um, I think uh, probably a, a more, uh, uh, there's, a, that, there's that common dilemma of the person who self-harms underneath their clothing, which is even more of a dilemma in winter. That uh, um, and if if I sort of had a sense of someone that, that they they might be hidden cuts, um, I, I might frame a question or something like, look, sometimes I ask people, do they have cuts? that I can't see, would you feel all right with me asking you that question? So I would just take it back one step more, uh, you know, more distant. So they've got a, they're a bit in control of where it goes from there. Um, it just gives the, the, the young person a little bit more um, way of managing a question they could find intrusive. Um, but uh, it, 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 I think we're always on that edge between not being too intrusive that it's traumatic, but not ignoring signs that need to be understood and noticed. Yeah. That's my thoughts. Thanks, thanks. I know that, thanks, Conrad. That, 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 that's fantastic. A lot of our participants this evening have been asking about the, uh, the, the role or the merits of medication in a, in a presentation like this. Philip, I'm just wondering, in, in your experience, is are antidepressant medications safe or effective for this type of patient population? Yeah, thanks, Conrad. Um, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of a, um, an advertisement here, which is for the um, College of Psychiatrists Guidelines on the Assessment and Management of Self-Harm, which are in the process of being revised and they are nearly complete. And when they are complete, they'll be available on the college website and they'll be accessible to anybody. Um, you just have to um, uh, Google RANZCP and then sort of follow the prompts. Um, I was one of the authors of the, the guidelines, so kind of know the content pretty well. Um, and the, the recommendation about antidepressants in the context of self-harm is only prescribe them if there is clearly a a condition present that's responsive to antidepressants and that doesn't include the self-harming behaviour. So we know that antidepressants don't stop self-harm. Um, so what are the, uh, the circumstances where you would prescribe an antidepressant in the context of self-harm? Well, um, the most sensitive uh, uh, disorder to antidepressants is actually obsessive compulsive disorder, so that's a good one. Um, more severe forms of anxiety. And then third on the list is depression. Depression doesn't respond so well to antidepressants, even though that's what they're called. Um, and uh, that's especially true when we talk about people under the age of 18, where um, the response of depressive symptoms to antidepressants is, is not particularly good. Look, the reason for that is that often they're being prescribed for the wrong kind of depression. Um, they're being prescribed for um, depression that's really arising from circumstances and bad situations. And the, um, the best management of that kind of depression is to help the person through the situation and to resolve um, the difficulties. Um, the kind of depression that responds to antidepressants is the one uh, where there's more obvious physical symptomatology associated with it, where the person slowed down, having um, significant sleep disturbance, and by that I mean trouble waking, uh, uh, sorry, trouble um, um, staying asleep, they tend to wake very early in the morning, where the appetite is suppressed, uh, where they're very lethargic, those, those, kind of, uh, those kind of symptoms. And I just want a final comment, which is actually there are some antidepressants which in the short term are known to increase the risk of self-harming behaviour, particularly in young people. Um, uh, the two that stand out of them are vaccine and peroxazine. Mm. Well, that's, that's, that's frightening. That's frightening. Rachel, I'm going to uh, to pass the, the final question on to you for this evening. A lot of our participants have been worrying about the, the all of the broader impact for the for the family. Uh, we're worried about the the role of the father, but as we, we've already mentioned, that the role of the the mother and the sisters in, involved here. Uh, you know, in, in the, the broader context of, of managing self-harm in our, in our young patients, is there a role where we can better involve or support the parents or family involved in care of patients like this? Um, thanks for that question. I think it's a really important one to um, give very careful thought to 
we can sometimes um, fall into the trap of um, alienating the rest of the family with the, the focus on the young person and especially where there's perpetrator of violence as part of the family as well. And finding ways to be able to connect with the family and it's it will be sometimes a very tricky um, balancing act but it can be very rewarding and very helpful for both the young person and for the family. And again, if I was to refer to some of the my own experiences in that regard is where I've worked in teams where we've had a young person who's very troubled and the the split between the um the team and the family has has been making things much worse and where we actually engaged with one of our clinicians to see the family separately to see the young person and where that where it's possible to um put that time and effort in i think it makes a, it can make a, a big difference in supporting the family because they will be struggling as well and it's also important to use some of the resources that are available online. And there's a number of those that you can refer family to. And resources like um, texts, uh, you know, a book that I've got in front of me at present, When Your Child Is Cutting. There are a number of those sorts of um, books and, and resources available. And I'd actually encourage each of you to make sure that you've got access to to some of those um, resources that you can um, share with family members. It, it makes a big difference for them to know that they're not um, totally outside of, of what's happening to their child. Oh, fantastic, Rachel. Thanks so much for, for addressing that so succinctly. It's, uh, yeah, it, it is something which we're always concerned about. So that pretty much brings us to an end of the, this evening's webinar. Just in just in recapping, some of the, the main points that we've covered tonight is the, the importance of providing uh, providing these these patients with a safe place to uh, to to uh, open up and to to speak honestly and, and confidentially, making sure that we're looking after her safety at all all times, knowing the team around you who you're going to be be working with and being able to refer effectively within within that team. Having some online resources available if uh, if your actual physical or uh, or, or uh, healthcare resources don't stretch to to that that extent, and also the uh, the very important point there that don't be quick to to jump to uh, prescribing antidepressants for for these patients unless you think there's a clear condition there which is going to respond to it, but the use of appropriate uh, psychotherapy techniques by uh, by appropriately trained members of our team really is the, the key to, to ensuring that we, we get somewhere with, with this. So thank you so much, everybody, for, uh, for your participation this evening. And to all the panellists, thank you again for, uh, for your, your help as well. Um, we're just going to, uh, to, to remind you that the, when you log out, there will be a, a brief exit survey which will appear. Uh, we would ask everybody to please make sure they, they complete those. And uh, we will be sending out, emailing out the attendance certificates for those who need to obtain points for this. Uh, we have referred to a lot of online resources this evening as well. Those will be collated and, and a link to those will be available on, on the webinar. And of course, you're all uh, logged in for the Mental Health Professionals Network website. Uh, so do keep an eye on that for the, for the next webinar. Uh, that one is actually going to be coming up in tw on 27th of July on bullying in the workplace. So uh, everybody think about that one. Now, of course, the, the key of the Mental Health Professionals Network is collaboration. And uh, it's fantastic to have an online resource uh, environment like this, but it's also great if you can look at developing a uh, network in your local area. So there's a, a lot of those available. There may already be one which you'd be able to, to join. Of course, we've been looking at a lot of uh, youth uh, issues that this evening, and it's important that we also know what our local resources are on there. So there's a link to, to those. And of course, um, back to the, uh, to the MHPN, mhpn.org.au website, for a vast range of resources, as well as webinar links to all of the, the previous podcasts and, and sessions which we've had. 
So with that, uh, thank you very much to, to everybody. I'd like to certainly close in acknowledging the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in, in the past, those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone for your participation this evening. Good night.